Okay, it's six o'clock on the dot. So I'm gonna begin. Thanks everybody for coming tonight to listen to the program. I'm Katie Wallace. I'm a traditional naturopath with human nature. And the program tonight is Overcoming a Sensitive Stomach. I'd like to say before I start that I'm not a medical doctor. So this information is for health education reasons only. And if you have any questions, please write them in the chat, which is typically down at the bottom of the Zoom window. And we'll have time for questions at the end. So let's go. This program is brought to you as a part of a monthly lecture uh, promoted by the Willie Street Co-op. And so I've served as the co-op's nutritionist for I think 14, probably 14 years. And part of that is giving these monthly lectures, which are now Zoom. So there will be a lecture uh, next month and um, also in May. Actually, I meant, to, I meant to make a slide about that and didn't get to it. Hang on, I'll give you the information about that. So April's talk will be on Wednesday, April 21st, it'll be all about fats, holistic fats, and that will actually be over the lunch hour, so 12 o'clock central time. And then May's talk will be, let's see if I can find it here, all about leaky gut, which we're going to talk a little bit about tonight. So if you want to learn more about leaky gut after hearing what I say tonight, feel free to tune in. That's going to be Wednesday, May 12th from noon to one as well. So I'm going to ask people, uh, if you don't mind, to turn your video off so that we use less bandwidth. Um, of course, I get to keep mine on. I think it's helpful to see me. But um, if you don't mind, I think there were like 50 people registered. So just in case we get that many, it helps with uh, the Zoom. Um, so thanks. The other thing that I do for the Willie Street Co-op besides these monthly lectures is that I provide reduced sessions to co-op members a handful of sessions every month for $40. And it's a 45 minute private session that was in the stores. Now it's virtual uh, during the pandemic. And so if you're interested in one of those sessions, you wanna uh, work with me one-on-one, -on -one, that's a great way to get to know me. And you can contact me at my office in order to register for one of those reduced fee sessions. Okay, so the idea for this talk was actually born nine years ago um, because I read this article. At the time, I had my private practice, Human Nature, um, but I also was working for Group Health Cooperative here in Madison, and I would stop on my lunch break and read the New York Times, which is always in the staff room, and I read this article, and the title is Combating Acid Reflux May Bring a Host of Ills. So the article is all about the problems that the medications for acid reflux can potentially cause for people. And the bottom line is that, you know, they, they state in the article that lifestyle changes clearly work to address heartburn and acid reflux, and that the medications cause a lot of side effects like malabsorption and anemia. But then they ended the article by saying, but most people don't really want to change their lifestyle to get over their problem. And I thought, well, I'm sure that's true of some people, but I know so many people that are willing to and have successfully changed their lifestyle in order to overcome their stomach issues. And, you know, I should give a free talk about this. So, um, so I did give this talk, uh, first talk several years ago. And so you're getting the new and improved version of it. So I hope you like it. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem we're addressing tonight is problems with the stomach. So I'm talking about the upper GI system, specifically possibly heartburn or acid reflux, which are defined as where there is burning or pain in the chest area after you've had a meal or when you're lying down are most common. And uh, acid reflux is described as when there's acid or bile, so digestive secretions actually irritating the esophagus, which is the, the pipe between your mouth and your stomach. So um, I think this is considered a chronic problem for people when it happens more than a, a couple times a week at least. And the hard thing about addressing acid reflux and heartburn is that there are many different underlying causes. So there's not just one cause and then boom, you address that cause, you're fine. <laughs> so just to give you an example, 
some people just aren't chewing their food enough. Uh, some people don't have adequate stomach acid. We'll talk a little bit more about this because I know that seems counterintuitive since the symptom is so acidic. There can be a lack of sufficient bile flow from the liver gallbladder. Somebody could have a poor diet or just be very sensitive to the foods they're eating. They could have an impaired gut lining. And by that, I mean leaky gut. We'll talk more about that. They could have a big disruption to their healthy flora or their good bacteria in the gut. This could be caused by antibiotics, um, by not getting healthy bacteria when we're born, um, or, or just by stress. There's so many things that affect our gut biome these days. There can be an infection, and there commonly is an infection when somebody actually has a clinical presentation and receives the diagnosis of GERD um, or acid reflux, so we'll talk about that. And sometimes there are structural issues with the sphincter at the top of the stomach um, and just stress. Stress um, encourages our, para our sympathetic response, sorry. So there's two parts of the nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And when we're overly stressed, we don't digest well um, because we're too keyed up. So we don't make digestive secretions and don't break our food down very well. So, so many different issues and someone with heartburn uh, may have one or multiple or all of these. Um, and so it takes a little bit of detective work and, to identify what you need. So my solution for the problem is changing the diet. And we'll talk about the diets that I've used with people over the years that consistently help them overcome having stomach issues, the supplements that help with the symptoms, and how do you really identify what those underlying issues are, ideally, so that you can correct the underlying issue, and then you have more flexibility with your diet and don't need to take as many supplements, ideally. But before we get on to the solution, I would just want to make sure we're all on the same page about healthy digestion. So a healthy digestive system is going to have healthy secretions. So these are fluids that your body makes to break down the food. So when we eat food, we coat it with saliva in the mouth and we swallow it and it sits in the esophagus in the upper stomach here for 15 to 30 minutes while the stomach is making an acid bath. It's making that acid bath to kill things in the food that don't belong in your gut and also to activate certain enzymes like pepsin that help break things down, help breaking down protein and minerals specifically in the stomach. So your stomach gets this acid bath and the stomach also has muscles that are um, sophisticated and help break down um, the food through that mechanical action. So the combination of the chemical and the mechanical action really help to break the food down a lot. Of course, if you use your teeth when you're chewing, that helps also to break the food down a lot. So these steps are all really critical for good digestion. And then the food is gonna drip, drip, drip from the bottom of the stomach into the small intestine here, where it's going to meet enzymes from the pancreas that are triggered by the stomach acid and bile from the gallbladder, which is under the liver, which holds the bile. The bile and the enzymes and the stomach acid all come together in the small intestine. And that's like pop and sizzle. Like if you've ever been to, uh, even as a kid growing up, I remember going to science fairs and everybody wanted to make a volcano out of vinegar and baking soda, right? So that's acid and alkaline. The alkaline is the pancreatic and the liver gallbladder outputs and the acid is from the stomach. So pow, that's good digestion. That's where you're not having malabsorption, you're not having food sensitivities, you're, you're fully using chemistry to break down your food. And then the food gets absorbed across the lining of the small intestine and it makes its way, sorry, I'm trying to use my mouse here, but it's being enigmatic. Um, anyway, it makes the food will make its way from the small intestine into the large intestine. And most of our good bacteria live in the large intestine. So they help um, with various functions and we absorb a lot of water from the stool um, as it moves through. And then we have a bowel movement. So that's the sequence of healthy digestion. And then um, 
Another part of that, besides those secretions, is having a healthy mucosal lining. So the lining of the digestive system, the mucosal lining is only a single cell thick. So in some ways it's very vulnerable. Um, and when that mucosal lining gets damaged, then we tend to have a lot of digestive symptoms um, and we'll be more sensitive. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. You've got to have good bacteria. You've got to have the right balance of bacteria. And a lot of that depends on having the right digestive secretions because the secretions set up the chemistry which determines which species can live in your gut. So if you don't have enough stomach acid, you're not gonna have enough good bacteria. You're gonna open yourself up to bad bacteria or fungus like candida, parasites um, that create more stomach issues. You also have to have a healthy diet. So gosh, the list of things of all you need here are getting pretty long, but if you don't eat enough protein, like good quality protein, and you don't eat high mineral foods, so we're looking at the standard American diet, not very good source of minerals for people, um, then you can't make the digestive secretion. So it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. If you don't eat well, then you can't make the se secretions you need, and then you can't digest what you eat, and it can be a vicious cycle for people. And this, and by adequate protein and minerals, I mean not only maybe what people think is a healthy diet or what you know you may have read is a healthy diet, but truly what is the healthy diet for you. So it's very important sometimes to individualize the diet um, and go beyond some of the mainstream thoughts about diet in order to determine the right diet for someone. So we're going to talk about the right foods for a touchy stomach in a minute, but before that I want to talk about leaky gut because Oftentimes people with stomach issues have this problem called leaky gut, which is also termed hyperpermeable intestines. So our gut wall is designed to have some pores in it so that we can absorb nutrients. But when someone has leaky gut, the pores or the holes between the cells are too big. And so the digestive system's not working. And this is a pretty normal process we're now understanding that people normally undergo leaky gut um, through different life stages and as a part of aging, but it's not at all beneficial for us in most cases. And um, it appears that it's correlated with chronic inflammation and disease. So here's another uh, way to look at leaky gut. I'm a very visual person. So you can see if we're looking at the digestive lining, how the gut cells are just one cell layer thick and they have what's called tight junctions. These are proteins that hold them together. And when the tight junctions get broken down, then it's leaky gut. And the problem with that is that then all these food particles or bad bugs you picked up at the salad bar or who knows what are getting down into your bloodstream. And that's not supposed to happen. This lining is supposed to be a filter and you're only supposed to let nutrients through, not particles. And so when you get particles through, the particles enter the bloodstream and guess what? Right underneath the gut lining is a huge vault of immune cells ready to defend you should something get into your bloodstream. So let's say these, these little green things look like peas. Let's say we get, you're eating some peas and you got leaky gut and some peas are getting into your bloodstream. Your immune system's gonna freak out and it's only peas. So you don't want your immune system getting upset and getting really inflamed from that. But this is how people can get, um, can develop autoimmune issues and other diseases or um, just become very sensitive to foods that are otherwise healthy for them. Uh, so like I said, we're going to talk about, I'm going to give a free program about leaky gut in a couple months, but in brief, leaky gut can be, um, can be developed by, uh, caused by alcohol, different medications, uh, pregnancy, um, uh, Roundup or glyphosate, the chemical that's on a lot of the um, conventional foods in our food supply also causes leaky gut. Uh, different chemicals that we're exposed to um, just commonly, just being in a modern society, tend to trigger leaky gut. So, um, so it can be difficult to avoid leaky gut. 
So you want to do something about this. So basically, this very important part of the digestive um, screening out process isn't working. This isn't good. And um, this leads to something called pro-inflammatory cytokine production, which is a mouthful that basically means the immune system is making a lot of chemicals that it doesn't want to. So um, I'm, I'm sure everybody is listening in has probably heard about the uh, COVID-19. And one of the um, notable things about the coronavirus is when it gets to that second stage, there's a huge um, mass of pro inflammatory cytokine production, just like we're talking about here with leaky gut. And so it's like the immune system has just gotten out of control. This is making all these chemicals um, to, to try to address, um, you know, uh, let's, say, let's say we're in a house and there's an invading virus. So the immune system is basically burning down the house. So that's not productive. And um, so we, we want to um, do different things that help calm this immune response and help seal up the gut um, in, in this particular case when we're talking about digestive issues. So we don't have this chronic inflammation that can kind of get out of control and have some other outcomes that are undesirable. So when left unchecked, you could see people have mental health issues, cancer, heart disease, autoimmunity, all of this is documented in the medical literature to be correlated to leaky gut. So here's just one more way of looking at leaky gut. You can see here on the left, um, nutrients can get through a healthy gut, but all these other particles can't. Um, and with an unhealthy uh, gut lining, and, and by the gut lining, I mean everything from the mouth down to the anus. So this can happen, leaky gut can happen all the way through and you can see lots of inflammation in all sections of the digestive system, including um, aggravating the lining around the stomach and the esophagus. Okay, so what are we gonna do about all this? Obviously we want to eliminate acid reflux and heartburn. And if somebody's got leaky gut, we wanna take care of that too. So I counsel most people to change their diet. And one of the biggest changes I suggest is eliminating grain-based foods. So that would be like rice and bread, um, pasta, um, really heavy starchy foods, as well as obviously anything else they're eating that's really bad for them, like soda or sugar, um, those are gonna sabotage the process of trying to get better. So those foods need to go and they need to emphasize lots of vegetables in the diet, lots of healthy fats and adequate protein, like grass-fed bison is great, beef, fish, seafood, all excellent. If the person uh, once you eat carbohydrates, like they're not on a ketogenic or a very low carb diet, for example, then eating starchy vegetables like sweet potatoes or root vegetables like beets and carrots are acceptable. Fats are really important. If you think about eliminating the high carbohydrate foods like grains, then you're going to need to replace those calories with something and that's fat. So here's some examples. We've got eggs, olives, uh, walnuts, coconut, these are just a few examples of some beneficial fats um, that you can use to, to provide fuel while going through an elimination. Um, and one of the reasons, well, maybe I should back up a little bit and talk about um, some of the top six allergens and then we'll talk a little bit more about the grain piece. So these are the top foods that I would eliminate from the diet in order to improve a situation with acid reflux or heartburn. So gluten, gluten is a protein in wheat, uh, barley, rye, um, it, and um, it's, it's a big target for the immune system. So when someone has a digestive issue and they have some problem with their mucosal lining or their gut lining, gluten, it, because it's been bred for I don't know, however many hundreds of years, it has a huge molecular peptide structure. And remember how I was saying that when the food is like filtering through the gut lining and you've got all these immune cells in your body under the gut lining, just waiting to protect you. Well, the way they discern what they go after to make antibodies and launch an immune response is the size of the peptide or the protein in the food. So gluten is like monumental. It's like unlike any other food in terms of having this huge peptide. 
And so it's a big target. It's nothing personal against gluten. It's just, it's a big target for the immune system. So if you've got any of that vulnerability in your digestive system, gluten is very commonly a target and needs to be eliminated. Could there be cases where it doesn't? Of course, all of us are different. Um, you know, it, it's um, impossible to always to identify someone's food sensitivities without um, sophisticated and expensive testing, which I also offer. But if you just want a general approach of what foods, what works for people generally, then, um, then gluten is definitely out. And that's why the grains are out too, because gluten and grains are very cross-reactive. That means once the body is aggravated by gluten, it's very likely to be aggravated by the same proteins in the grains because they're just very similar biologically. So this is what I find what works for people. Sugar obviously also has to be eliminated. It's a, a big trigger for inflammation because it promotes insulin. It's also feeding the bacterial overgrowth that's kind of contributing to um, the upset digestive system. Dairy, again, nothing personal, but dairy is a big molecular structure, can be very difficult to digest. So I find that people can eliminate their symptoms very quickly within a week when they get on this diet, um, but they need to eliminate all dairy, at least in the beginning. Corn has a protein very similar to gluten. And soy, again, is a large molecular peptide structure and peanuts are the same. So these are kind of Let's say you said, okay, Katie, you know, I hear that you're, you know, having good luck with this diet and everything, but, you know, I don't want to go grain free. What should I do? Well, I'd say, well, start with this. Additionally, I found that these other foods tend to be triggers for people with um, a very sensitive stomach. So coffee, anything in the nightshade family. So that would be peppers, tomatoes, eggplant. Uh, grains, we already talked about that. Nuts, nuts are sometimes a big problem, especially if someone has um, a very aggravated stomach. So I would steer clear of those in the beginning. Um, and anything that you know hurts you, okay? So if you know that vinegar or lemon juice are like the worst thing ever, then you, know, you shouldn't be eating those until you've healed and resolved things. And I would suggest doing this diet for um, four to eight weeks at least. And then, uh, like I said, usually within the first week, someone's symptoms are vastly improved. They're not having acid reflux anymore. Um, they're not having heartburn. And um, then after an eight week period, you can try to reintroduce some of the foods and um, you know, see slowly, one at a time, um, and you know, see what, what's working and what's still not working. Um, one more thing about the grains and the reason why I like to have people go on a grain-free diet when they have a sensitive stomach is that um, it's very important, as I mentioned, to have adequate stomach acid and grains and other high starch foods suppress stomach acid because they're, um, they take an alkaline env environment to break them down. So the stomach just works better when it's not being inundated by grain-based foods or high starch foods constantly. Okay, and we already talked about this slide. So protein and fat are really critical. I find that people with a sensitive stomach are often very sensitive to blood sugar swings. So they'll sometimes have acid reflux um, out of the blue and they're like, I, I, did, I ate the same thing today as yesterday. Why do I have acid reflux today? And a lot of times when you talk to them more, I, I find that they skipped a meal or they were very stressed or somehow they, they went too long without eating. Um, so just a warning about that. It's important to get on a schedule with your meals and stick to a schedule so your body knows when it's going to get a meal. Someone who's got a sensitive stomach is more vulnerable to inflammation. And when your blood sugar is too high or too low, you're going to be more vulnerable to inflammation in those situations. So sometimes it's not really about what you ate, um, it's about what you didn't eat. <laughs> so, you know, you wanna kind of have balance in all things. So protein can especially help with the person who tends to have blood sugar problems. 
Protein is very satiated. It gives the body fuel, um, helps the endocrine system to keep the blood sugar balanced. So I suggest um, 0.5 to one grams of protein to lean uh, body mass. So if we have a 180 pound person and they've got 160 pounds of lean tissue, then that would be a minimum of 80 grams protein daily, just to give you an idea. And um, like a can of tuna is usually about 25 grams. So every meal pretty much needs to have an adequate uh, serving of protein. And you can scale that up or down depending on how big you are and how active you are, how muscly you are. Um, but I think most people are not aware um, that they need to be better meeting their protein needs. Fat also, I mean, I was, I was born in the 70s and uh, raised in the era of low fat. And it's unfortunate that now people kind of have a phobia um, about fat, but fat is very beneficial. There are many, many good fats that should be eaten in more abundance than they are. So when you're with, um, if you wanted to embark on this diet, um, you'd want to eat as much fat as you need to feel satiated. So for most people, that's one or two tablespoons per meal. So by fat, I mean like olive oil or coconut oil, um, or if, if you can tolerate nuts or olives, those may be used. Um, sometimes avocados work well for people, butter, lard, sometimes work for people as well. So these are just um, a few examples. Mayo, like a healthy avocado-based mayonnaise is another example of a fat. And then of course you wanna eat like a ton of vegetables. <laughs> so this slide's all about protein and fat, but that's not just what you're, you're eating if you wanna get um, a healthier stomach. You wanna eat six to eight, sorry, six to nine cups of vegetables daily, ideally. Okay, so um, just to summarize, make sure you're eating adequate protein and fat at three meals a day. Don't let your blood sugar crash. Make sure you're eating plenty of vegetables. Pick ones that work for you. You know, if you know there's a vegetable out there that upsets you, obviously don't eat that. Um, if you need to eat carbohydrates, then eat starchy vegetables. So those would be like root vegetables, like radishes, carrots, parsnips, turnips, rutabagas. Um, and you know, this whole process of changing the diet admittedly does take time and energy. So it's good to be thinking about that at the get-go. How am I gonna, you know, how am I gonna make time for this? Um, and what are, what are my go-to foods going to be? Um, so really for a lot of people overcoming digestive issues is about, um, not just about identifying what they need to do, but making the time for the, to take care of themselves. Okay, so step one was change the diet. Step two would typically be soothe and repair the gut lining. So I already talked all about how the gut lining can be very aggravated in this state. So you remove the foods that are aggravating the digestive lining so that it can heal. But um, a lot of times, if you reintroduce those foods without doing anything special to heal the gut lining, it's just gonna go right back to the way it was. It's gonna be aggravated all over again. So that's where you need to use natural health supplements to help the mucosal lining to recover. And this is an example of a supplement that does that. It's a combination of glutamine, um, zinc carnosine, and mucilaginous herbs. And there's, uh, there's uh, a number of different options. This is just one of my favorites, the GI Revive from Designs for Health. But you'll see um, marshmallow root in some of them or deglycerized licorice in others. And it's a formula that's very soothing and healing to the mucosal lining. And this can be very important for people with a history of acid reflux because it, with the stomach acid and bile coming up, aggravating the mucosal lining of the esophagus um, and, and the stomach lining, um, you can't really get good digestion to happen um, and get the inflammation under control until you do something to heal the gut lining. So this is a powder and powdered supplements like this are typically taken a couple day, times a day at least um, in between meals. If somebody has active um, symptoms with their stomach, then this can be taken before and after a meal as well. So you can take it several times a day if needed in the beginning to help get the symptoms 
calm down and, and heal that mucosal lining. There's also foods that really help with this healing process that are mucilaginous. So they, um, they help um, kind of coat and soothe the digestive lining. So okra, asparagus, um, you can do licorice root tea. Although a note about that is that licorice um, can elevate people's blood pressure. So it's not for people with high blood pressure. So after you've changed the diet, and begun to soothe the mucosal lining, then it's very important to work on stomach acid secretions. And this might seem counterintuitive because most people feel like they've got too much acid, but that's rarely the case when we actually measure people's acid levels. Um, and so what's commonly happened is I mentioned in the beginning that the stomach uses mechanical and chemical action to break down the food. Most of us at the age of 30, our stomach acid starts plummeting. And if we don't make enough stomach acid, the sphincter at the top of the stomach doesn't close. And so the stomach's making up for the lack of chemical action, the lack of the stomach acid by using more mechanical and it's pushing the stomach acid up. So acid reflux and GERD are typical signs there's a, actually not enough stomach acid because if you were making enough stomach acid, it would close the sphincter at the top of the stomach. And sometimes when this has been going on for so long, that sphincter doesn't even um, close anymore. It's like bent the other way. And so that, um, that's a special case that requires sometimes surgery or, um, or a lot of body work. There's a, um, some different ways to work with that issue. But anyway, um, I have found that helping people with their stomach acid secretions is the most beneficial way to help them overcome acid reflux. And um, clients will come back and tell me, you know, um, a long time, you know, two or three years after I helped them with their stomach issue that they're doing fine now. And once in a while, if they're at a restaurant and they kind of, you know, splurge or eat something that they wouldn't normally eat, and then they have reflux that they just take some apple cider vinegar or something to help them with uh, stomach acid and it goes away completely. Their symptoms go away completely. So, so things that help promote stomach acid, which is hydrochloric acid production are sea salt. So sea salt is sodium chloride. So it helps provide the chloride for making hydrochloric acid. Um, so just using a pinch in your food can help over time with building up stomach acid levels using some lemon juice in your meal or in water or apple cider vinegar in water or in marinades or salad dressings can also help uh, stimulate some stomach acid. Now these aren't nearly as strong as my favorite thing to use, which is called betaine HCL or betaine hydrochloride. And so sometimes those, the, the aforementioned things, the salt, the lemon juice, the apple cider vinegar, um, might work a little bit for people, but they don't truly resolve the issue for them. And that's where the betaine really shines because it's much stronger, it's derived from beets and it's very stimulating to stomach acid. So you can do a special protocol, but I would work with a practitioner such as myself to do it where you dose the betaine correctly so that it stimulates stomach acid and then you wean off the betaine after you've um, corrected your stomach acid levels again. If you try some of these things and they really aggravate your system, they make everything worse for you, you need to go back to the previous step and work on healing your mucosal lining and possibly get better assessments and testing done to figure out what's, what else is maybe involved in your situation. Um, because when these things are working, you're not gonna have any upset from them. And when you have healthy stomach acid, you're not gonna have reflux or other issues in most cases. Um, one quick tip about that is that a lot of people are accustomed to drinking a lot of liquid with meals. And this is one of the worst things to do if you've got a stomach problem because drinking a lot of water reduces uh, and dilutes all of your digestive secretions. So if you're in the habit of drinking a tall glass of water at the table, it's better to try to change that habit. I would suggest having the glass of water 15 to 30 minutes before the meal actually starts and allowing some time for um, your digestive juices to, to um, be ready for the meal. If you do need to drink with a meal, I mean, that's understandable. I like having a glass 
at the meal with me, but I typically will only have about four ounces. So just try to keep the liquid to a minimum. So kind of in the same grouping as working on stomach acid would be working on bile flow and liver support. So a lot of people with stomach issues also have bile flow problems. And in this case, you need to do more fats that work for you and some herbs like dandelion and yellow dock, triphala, these are examples of herbs that help with bile flow and may be taken at meals. I really like a supplement by Biotics Research that's beet-based called Beta TCP. Prunes are another example of a food, especially if you soak them first and eat them with a meal, they can help with the bile flow. So if you're somewhere where it seems like fat is always making your stomach issue worse, then that, that's what's going on for you and you need to um, seek out a solution for fat digestion in order to help resolve the problem. So if we continue with digestion, you know, it goes from the mouth to the stomach to um, the liver gallbladder and also the pancreas. So the pancreas is always making digestive enzymes and it's stimulated to do that by the stomach acid. Uh, and so when there's um, a stomach problem, people often really benefit from a supplemental digestive enzyme. This is just an example of one I like, orthodigestine, but digestive enzymes are supplements that provide extra enzymes to help digest the food. Um, and that can be important um, because if you're not digesting your food, then you're more likely to have immune responses. Um, and you're also more likely to have overgrowth of bad bacteria and other not desirable critters in your digestive system. So you wanna have complete digestion um, with digestive enzymes in order to address other parts of the digestive system. Okay, the next step would be um, to do special assessments. So get some information about you to see what else you need besides diet change. Um, special assessments can help with um, identifying proper diet. They can help with identifying proper supplements. Um, and this may be step number one for you. So there's nothing wrong with starting with assessments and then coming up with your plan. Um, but I think a lot of people, because the assessments can be expensive, like to change their diet and try some supplements first, see how they do. If their problems aren't resolving with that or they're not happy with that situation, then they um, are ready to invest and in getting some data about themselves to fine tune their plan. So one of the ways that I work with people is looking at their basic blood chemistry. And there's actually a number of markers, just like in a comprehensive metabolic panel that tell me how well someone is digesting. Um, also looking at a lipid panel, um, assessing basic vitamin D, CBC with differential. So these are relatively inexpensive ways um, that you can get more specialized and really work with the individual. And I have highlighted here the GI MAPS tool test because this is my favorite um, special <laughs> digestive assessment to do. It's just so powerful um, and really helps fine tune someone's digestive health plan so that they can resolve it. Food sensitivity panels can also be very helpful, but they can be very costly. And so again, those are usually coming in after a person's tried um, some initial shifts and they're not getting as much progress as they wanted. But sometimes a strong food sensitivity, like to eggs or gluten or dairy or you know some other food the person loves to eat are really causing havoc. And even if they're doing everything else right, if they're sensitive to a food, then the digestive system's not going to heal the way they want it to. So I wanna talk a little bit about the um, GI map. I think that it's really important for people with stomach issues because it's very sensitive. It's the most sensitive stool test that's out there. Um, it records things at the cellular level in a stool sample. And so, um, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to people with stomach issues, I say, well, you know, have you been tested for H. pylori, which is a bacteria that's commonly occurring with someone who has um, stomach issues and they'll say, well, yes, or maybe I did in the past, but now I was negative. This test is gonna pick it up 
even in a case where the medical test did not find it because it's very sensitive. It's gonna record if it's there, even if it's at subclinical levels. And some people are very sensitive and they may have a subclinical level of a bacteria like H. pylori or something else. And uh, maybe for most people that lower level wouldn't be aggravating, but for this one person it is. And so I really like this test because it's extremely sensitive so that if something is there that's known to cause the symptom in the digestive system, we're, we're gonna be likely to find it. Um, I have people do a special protocol to prepare for the test to break down what's called the biofilms that the different bacteria create around themselves. Um, but other than that, it's, it's a pretty accessible test for people. Secondly, the test is really relevant. I've never uh, ordered this test or suggested it for someone and then felt like we were sorry that we spent the money on it or that I, they spent their money on it. Um, and we went over the test results because it shows you about your good flora and bad flora and then has a number of intestinal health markers. And it also looks for parasites and fungi um, and a lot of other critters that cause problems. So um, we can see, for example, if there's a species there that causes constipation for people. So I'll often find that or a particular species in overgrowth that's correlated with food sensitivities or um, sinus infections um, or acid reflux. So I always find that the results are very relevant and it's also very comprehensive. I've already mentioned all the different areas that it tests about someone's digestive system. So this kind of a test really shines when we're talking about stomach issues because we know that there can be so many underlying causes and it really is very comprehensive at testing them all. So then you know what you're dealing with. Here's just an example of one of the pages. The results are five pages long, so you get so much information. Um, but here on the intestinal health section, you get a measure for how well someone's digesting fat. So you know, oh, okay, is, is fat the problem? Does a person need a supplement to help them digest fat? Or is the supplement they're taking working? Um, you test elastase one, which is a marker for pancreatic enzyme output. So this person's number was low. Is it low because they're not making enough stomach acid because they have H. pylori? So we're gonna find that out. And then we're gonna say, well, this number is so low, you need to take a digestive enzyme until we can improve this number. Beta-glucuronidase is an example of a number correlating with how toxic the colon is. So you get a sense, does this person need help with detoxifying the colon or not? Is that a part of the problem? Occult blood, obviously, is there blood or not? That can be a sign of more serious issues and needing to go see um, a medical specialist. Uh, secretory IgA is a marker that looks at the immune system. So in this case, this person's immune system is just exhausted in their gut. IgA is something secreted in the gut. Why is it exhausted? Okay, so we're looking for all these answers in the lab. Oh, it's exhausted because she has an H. pylori infection which has turned off her pancreatic enzymes. Okay, so let's do a supplement that helps build up secretory IgA so that we can be successful in getting rid of this subclinical infection. Let's give her some enzymes to help her break her food down so she's not reacting to food so much. Antigliadin IgA is a gluten test. Um, so you can see even though she's within the normal, her Sig A is so low, we know, whoa, she's really sensitive to gluten. And maybe she's been avoiding gluten and she's getting gluten um, from somewhere. She doesn't even realize it. So this can be really helpful. People don't really realize maybe they're generally avoiding gluten, but not enough. And it's really exhausting their immune system that they're getting it from the source. Calprotectin is a marker for inflammation. She looked good here, but sometimes this level is very high and that gives you guidance on, oh, anti-inflammatories for the digestive system are gonna really help this person. And zonulin is a direct marker for leaky gut. So it's a protein that causes leaky gut. Um, so she was okay, but if we saw this level high, we would know, oh, okay, one of the other ringers in this case is that there's leaky gut and we need to work harder on that. So anyway, I didn't wanna go into all the different pages of the test result, but just wanted to give you a flavor of how there's so much information available 
when you can invest in the special assessments. So there's definitely good cases where that's needed. Okay, so um, we're at the end of the talk here. And to summarize, I suggest a diet change for people, lots of veggies, adequate protein, lots of fat, eliminate the high carbohydrate foods and use vegetable based um, starches where needed. Uh, and fruit, fruit's often um, okay too, but um, I do typically have people keep fruit to a minimum and try not to combine fruit with bigger meals if they have a sensitive stomach for better digestion. We talked about some of the supplements, supplements for the gut lining, supplements that help with the different digestive secretions. And then we talked about some of the tests that can be used to get, um, get more individualized and more finesse in a plan to overcome the issue. So uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. I'll look in the chat and see if there's any questions now. Just to remind you, if you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can do that through my office. I do have other appointments besides these special $40 sessions, but it's a nice deal and a nice way to get started. Um, and then also I hope you'll tune in next month for the fat talk in April and the leaky gut talk that'll be in May.